An unidentified migrant woman screams out, her child is missing. Agents from Mexico's Migration Institute apprehend her, along with other undocumented women. The frightened women, many from Central America, are pushed into a Mexican government vehicle. Another migrant mother separated from her child. New groups of migrants cross through southern Mexico daily. Many Haitian migrants are among them. Most left Haiti years ago and traveled to Brazil to seek refuge. But the economy there is also failing. We have been in Tapachula, Mexico for four months. We have no papers, no house, no food, nothing. There are many races here. As migrants continue to arrive, tensions are building in southern Mexico. The migration workers who kicked a Haitian citizen have been fired. Not one was carrying firearms. Mexico's president says his government wants to protect the migrants from becoming victims of kidnappings and murder at the hands of organized crime. If we open the way and they pass freely to the north, we run many risks. They run many risks. We cannot guarantee the safety of their lives. Meantime, U.S. detention centers are filling to capacity, and the United States continues deporting migrants to Mexico. Migration expert Dr. Leticia Calderon says Mexico is aware that ahead of U.S. midterm elections next year, Immigration will be a top political issue for President Biden. If Mexico detains the flow of migrants for just a few months, even if it comes at a political cost, that will give Biden some breathing room with the Republicans. Natural, political and economic disasters continue pushing migrants north. And there's another reason many go. They hope to reunite with family members already living in the United States. More than 14,000 migrants are stranded in Necocli, Colombia. These families are waiting to enter Panama and continue the difficult journey through Central America to cross the border to the United States. Today we are experiencing another crisis due to the holding up of more than 14,000 migrants that we have in the municipality of Nicocle, because more than 1,000 or 1,200 migrants arrive in Nicocle daily, and we can only dispatch 500 on the boats. Annually, tens of thousands of people pass through Nicocle, waiting for boats to take them to Panama. But the COVID-19 pandemic has added new challenges and a bottleneck situation for those waiting to leave. With COVID-19, we saw growth in unemployment and growth in poverty. So now we are seeing a growing phenomenon of migration all over the world. The majority of migrants waiting to travel are Haitian or Cuban, while others come as far as Africa. But all of them have the desperate need to find better opportunities and are willing to risk it all facing the treacherous clandestine journey across the jungle known as the Darien Gap in Panama.
de Colombiana y Frontera de Colombiana y Panamá. Ahí tengo mucho la. When we arrived here in the jungle on the border of Colombia and Panama, there are many thieves. They are raping ten-year-old children, eight-year-olds, and they steal money. And they also kill people. There are many dead people. We're asking for help. The government here has to send soldiers to the jungle. El gobierno de aquí tiene que mandar militares. Nicoclis Mayor Jorge Tobón Castro has called for the Panama and Colombian government to allow more migrants to cross. Castro warns that by the end of September, the migrant numbers could grow between 25 to 30,000. Last month, Colombia and Panama held a bilateral meeting to address the migratory situation in Necoclí, which at the time had 10,000 migrants stranded. Both nations agreed to receive up to 650 migrants daily at the shared border. But with the growing numbers, Colombia's migration agency has yet to respond to the migrant increase agreement at the shared border. Michelle Vega, CGTN, Bogota, Colombia. This morning, we're waiting on word on what happens to 80 Haitian migrants after the Coast Guard intercepted a sailboat just miles from South Florida. The Coast Guard tweeted out these photos of the crowded boat, which they say was about 18 miles from Biscayne Bay when they found it. They say they were told about the boat by a good Samaritan. Haitians have been fleeing the country, trying to reach America following last month's earthquake and the political turmoil following the assassination of their president. A boat packed with over 100 migrants stopped at sea. The Coast Guard making that interception less than 20 miles off the coast of Biscayne Bay. Local Tens Leanne Motorhome is live in Miami Beach with what we know about those on board. Well, we're still trying to figure out exactly how many men and women were on board, whether there were any children there. We do know that this was a very overpacked boat, coupled with the fact that they were on this boat and out on the water for nearly a week. The Coast Guard is speaking with more than 100 Haitian migrants who took to the seas on a 35-foot boat. The group was intercepted on Sunday after spending about six days at sea. There were way too many people on board. The Coast Guard says the boat was first spotted by a good Samaritan who called it in. The Coast Guard cutter Richard Etheridge arrived on scene and took the migrants on board with a final count of 104. The passengers all appeared to be doing well despite their long and dangerous journey. Yeah, it was a little surprising that we didn't have any health concerns. A recent earthquake and political turmoil are providing Haitians with strong reasons to want to leave their country. But the Coast Guard says a journey like this is never worth it. Our messages don't take to the sea um, in any, any shape or form. It's always dangerous. Uh, water conditions are um, can change on a moment's notice, weather conditions can change on a moment's notice, and it, we just, we advise don't do it. So what is next for this group of migrants? Well, we do know that once they were on board that Coast Guard cutter, every single one of them was interviewed. From there, they will start to determine whether or not any of them may have a valid asylum claim or if they'll have to be repatriated to Haiti. Reporting live on Miami Beach, I'm Leanne Morejon, Local 10 News. All right, we've got a developing story here in this live picture from Seven Sky Force. Reports of migrants arriving on Virginia Key. Ralph Rayburn has details in Seven Sky Force, Ralph. Yeah, Lynn and Jeff, this happening about uh, 45 minutes ago. Now you see the vessel here parked on the beach. As we bring the camera back out, you're going to see law enforcement in the form of a boat there. There's a the lower right-hand corner of the screen. That's a police boat. And then we've got uh, folks here from... Uh, <clears throat> from uh, Border Patrol, Customs and Border Patrol, along with the City of Miami Police Department and now Miami-Dade Police in the area out here in Virginia Key. They're all over the area uh, just to the south of the water treatment plant. They've got this area closed off and cordoned off. There's a, uh, I believe, yeah, there's a police helicopter right there. They've been looking. They took one person into custody so far. They believe there are several more still at large down here. The boat making landfall, as we said, about a half an hour ago. Uh, no one has been treated for any kind of injuries at this point, but they do have one person in custody. As we get more information, we'll get it back to you. That's our story here in Skyforce HD. I'm Ralph Ray reporting live. Ralph, thank you. This could be the worst year in American history for illegal border crossings. It already hit the top five with two months left to go in the fiscal year, not counting August, a tumultuous month. Border agents have encountered more than 1.3 million illegal border crossers so far. We were there as the border crisis hit a new peak, and we found the record numbers amid a virus pandemic have created a perfect storm of chaos. Somewhere in this tall brush... If it doesn't go any further, somebody may have just come in here. About a mile north of the Mexico border, 
They're right here. Another group of illegal border crossers has scattered. They're being tracked by Border Patrol agents following trails of trampled grass. We began the ride along with Border Patrol in McAllen, Texas, two hours before sunrise. In a matter of minutes, the first call. Nine people had just crossed the Rio Grande from Mexico. This woman tells us her two children came months ago and are waiting for her in Boston. Um, her children came across by themselves, and um, one's 11, one's 14. Border Patrol never closes, sleeps, or stops. And the Rio Grande Valley sector is the busiest in America during a record-setting year, making matters far worse than ever before, the pandemic. Just before our visit, one in five illegal border crossers in some groups were reportedly infected with COVID-19. How common is it that your agents screen somebody and they do seem to be sick? It, it does happen quite often, but we just encountered a group this morning of five individuals, and one of the females let one of our agents know that she has COVID. American citizens who leave the country can't get back in the U.S. without showing a negative COVID-19 test. But for non-citizens crossing illegally by the thousands, there are no such requirements, and the feds aren't testing them for COVID before releasing them in the U.S. This is, the, is this the main area, like the largest? The dysfunctional arrangement has left border communities and nonprofits scrambling to help the immigrants while protecting U.S. citizens from COVID. We immediately found out that they were not tested for, for the virus. So. Sister Norma Pimentel heads up Catholic Charities in the Rio Grande Valley, which operates a giant relief warehouse in McAllen. She says her group was initially placing COVID-positive families at local hotels, but quickly got overwhelmed. So that operation continued and grew as more people arrived here in greater numbers. Of course, we were getting so much more people with COVID positive. Uh, the percentage overall, is, it had always been about a 7% overall of COVID positives. But with the high numbers, that was a lot of people, you know. And so that's you where saw the COVID numbers go up or just the overall numbers? The overall numbers were going up, so the COVID numbers were, were high as well. And so uh, I said, if after today, if numbers continue as they are, we, we will not be able to have, hold them inside. Just before our arrival, local officials closed off a public park near the border eight miles away and set up a tent city to test immigrants and try to isolate the ones with COVID. Do you know about how many people are there? Right now, uh, it has already gone to 1,300 plus. Yeah, it's growing really quickly. Pimentel says the families of the McAllen Center are negative for COVID. Here, they connect with family members already in the U.S and are sent on their way to destinations across America. I would say uh, we process close to between 6,000 to uh, maybe a little bit out more this last two weeks in the one week. 6,000 a week? Maybe more, yeah. That's just a fraction of the total releases. Border Patrol is so overwhelmed, it's taking immigrants to other cities and spreading the crisis state to places like Laredo, Texas, a three-hour drive from McAllen. We should be embarrassed, frankly, as Americans uh, to, to have a system that is in chaos. Mayor Pete Sign says Laredo got inundated by the release of hundreds of immigrants a day. The city is suing the Biden administration to try to stop it. A week before our arrival, they began working under a temporary agreement where Border Patrol releases the immigrants at a central staging area. So they actually uh, transport these migrants a few blocks from their Border Patrol station, which is convenient for everyone, and they drop them off. And then they quickly board the buses. Uh, these are you know, air-conditioned buses, and as soon as a bus is filled, then uh, we're transporting them. Uh, primarily, we began with Dallas and Austin and Houston. Wait, wait, let me get this straight. They're coming into the McAllen area. They're being bused or taken here to Laredo, and then you are busing or taking them to Austin, Dallas, and Houston. Correct, correct. At, at a cost of between $8,000 to $10,000 a day. 
not because we don't want to treat them, it's because we can't. Uh, you know, it's, it's an impossibility at this point, simply because of the hospital, you know, very limited hospital capacity that we have. Americans who aren't down here on the border, they hear complaints and they don't know what to believe. Right. What would you tell them about that down here? I, as a mayor, just look at my city. I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. What what is working for my city? What is in the best interest of my city? Whatever system is now in place is not working. It's truly not working because we at the border are experiencing that that uh, that that risk, that danger, uh, the the burden. The federal government, if, you, if that's your policy, and that's fine, but implement it, package it, organize it, uh, operate it for us, and finance it. Uh, uh, but I haven't seen any of that. We asked for interviews with President Biden, Vice President Harris, and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, but none agreed to talk with us. In announcing the record number of illegal border crossings for July, Mayorkas blamed poor conditions in Central America, COVID-19, and President Trump. Tragically, former President Trump slashed our international assistance to Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, slash the resources that we were contributing to address the root causes of, irre of irregular migration. The Biden administration plan of action includes a major focus on more U.S. tax money for Central America. That includes $280 million to fight crime and corruption and for job opportunities, election participation, small businesses, and gender equality. Back in the field, agents are searching for a dozen illegal immigrants who bailed out of a vehicle and ran into a neighborhood. These men say they're from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Peru, Brazil, and Mexico. This man tells me he worked in financial services in Honduras and has a wife and daughter who came first, waiting for him in Denver. To get here, he says he agreed to pay the cartels $8,200, which raises another hard reality. The spike in illegal immigration is making the violent criminal cartels, called transnational criminal organizations or TCOs, even more prosperous. So every person who's caught here represents cash in the pocket of cartels. Correct. All the individuals that are crossed have to have paid somebody in order to come into the U.S. illegally in that manner. And she had to pay 50,000 quetzales. I don't know that. This woman says she paid the equivalent of more than $6,000 from Guatemala. She's headed to Ohio where she says her husband is already waiting for her. She said, uh, I just want to share that it was very difficult to journey here. I suffered a lot. There was no food. Martin Cuellar is sheriff in Webb County, which includes the city of Laredo. Before you cross that, that river behind us here, you know, you, you have to pay the cartels. And then when you pay them and you get here, then you have to cross, you know, the uh, Border Patrol checkpoints. And you have to pay also. We're making, you know, all this is making the cartels richer. Just counting the illegal border crossers agents have encountered this year represents an estimated $9 billion cash for the cartels. This woman says her dad, already in New York, paid for her. She and her three-year-old daughter were in a large group turning themselves in at a baseball park in La Jolla, Texas. The second bus full of the day here, and it's still just morning. Up next, in Donald Trump's first broadcast TV interview since leaving office, we ask him about the border crisis and a lot more. Before I begin, I ask unanimous consent that two articles be placed in the record, one that is entitled Guatemalan Orders New Travel Social Curbs as Virus Surges in That Country. Uh, the second one, uh, uh, Shizeki, uh, uh stands by having employer vaccine illegal immigrants get pa get a pass. Without objection. Mr. Chairman, since the last amendment was voted down, it makes this one all the more appropriate. 
Mr. Chairman, as you can see, this simple common sense amendment says if the president is to go forward and push and shove at the Constitution and tear at the very fabric of liberty for American citizens, requiring that firms that have more than 100 employees all be vaccinated uh, or face a, a fine of over $13,000 require that members of the military be vaccinated or be discharged and lose their retirement benefits, require, require, require CBC, uh, CP, CBP officers be vaccinated when in fact we do not vaccinate people who are brought into this country, and let me rephrase that, who come to this country illegally and are admitted when in fact we're releasing them into communities, when in fact 35 Customs and Border Patrol officers have died from COVID, when in fact uh, these officers, uh, just uh, so far 9,800 uh, uh, Border Patrol officers and employees have tested positive for COVID, many of them directly the result of having to come in close contact with the massive hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of undocumented workers who come, uh, undocumented persons who come into this country uh, and are released into our society, uh, often without notice to the communities. The idea that they would be released without being vaccinated is, is simply something we cannot uh, understand. And Mr. Chairman, as you consider the inevitability of, of your orders to not accept any amendments, I would ask that you take a good look and ask the question, how could you be so inconsistent on the president's orders and ability when it comes to people who are being released into the community, particularly as the earlier article I put in, Guatemala is one of the major countries delivering uh, undocumented individuals to us is in fact surging. We would not in the ordinary course allow someone to fly into this country untested and unvaccinated from Guatemala if they came legally and yet under current uh, law and current orders that is exactly what is going to happen not to a few hundred but to over a million people who will be admitted this year based on the current trend and the current paroles. Mr. Chairman, this is common sense. It will not take down the bill. It is completely within the, the uh, intent and jurisdiction of the, this legislation, just like the last one. It will be ruled by the parliamentarian uh, to be germane and sufficient. Well, our state is getting ready to welcome hundreds of evacuees from Afghanistan over the next few months. And local refugee organizations are putting out a call for anyone with empty apartments. Channel 3 New Haven Bureau Chief Matt McFarland shows us how the community is already stepping up. According to IRIS, the New Haven-based Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services, over the past five years, they've resettled more than 500 Afghans, mostly in the New Haven area. Over the past few weeks, they've already welcomed eight to ten families, and now comes the big surge. About 170 apartments is what we need across the state. 170 apartments. That's a lot. Chris George with Iris says this week a large number of Afghans fleeing the Taliban will arrive in our state to be placed with Connecticut's two refugee resettlement groups. There are churches and synagogues and mosques, rotary clubs, colleges, universities all across the state of Connecticut that have stepped forward to help Afghan refugees start a new life in Connecticut. Like here at the First and Summerfield United Methodist Church in downtown New Haven, which is working with Iris to offer space as needed for a temporary shelter for any Afghan evacuees until they can be resettled with long-term housing. We do this work out of very deep faith commitments. In all, George says Connecticut expects to see 700 Afghan refugees over the next 12 months, mostly families with young children. So they're looking for two to three bedroom apartments in New Haven and the surrounding towns, preferably on bus lines to help with transportation to services and jobs. And they've even hired two realtors to help in their apartment search. Most we will find in our area of strength, the greater New Haven area. We are opening an office in Hartford, so we will put a lot of people in the greater Hartford area. So not just Hartford, but, but East Hartford and West Hartford and Manchester and Rocky Hill and Glastonbury 
anywhere we can find apartments. And Iris says securing these apartments is just one issue. That's because right now it's in contact with 45 family members, friends, clients who are still over in Afghanistan. They went to visit family in the summer. Now they're stuck there, trapped, and they don't want to leave without their family. Reporting in New Haven, Matt McFarlane, Channel 3 Eyewitness News.